Hi, welcome to Training Minutes. Today we're going to talk about using pulse oximetry, which has been added to the first responder and the EMT curriculum. Pulse oximetry is a method of determining the oxygen level in your patient. It has many limitations. First thing that we're going to do is place the probe on the patient. So we have a finger probe that we're using with this device, and we're going to choose a finger that has the best blood flow. Of the fingers on your hand, your ring finger tends to be the finger that has the highest blood flow. So we'll place the probe on the patient's ring finger. We could put it on any one of the other fingers, preferentially one of the three middle fingers, not the thumb, not the pinky. And then we'll watch the pulse oximeter as it boots up. It's going to collect a pulse ox reading, which you see is 100% here, and the heart rate. From the patient. Now some of the issues with pulse oximetry have to do with things that it may detect other than oxygen that's in the patient. It's looking at the hemoglobin and determining the saturation of the hemoglobin with oxygen. It could be fooled, as firefighters know, by carbon monoxide. It's unable in conventional pulse oximeters like this device to be able to tell the difference between oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. So if this patient was pulled from a fire and had a 20% carboxyhemoglobin, carbon monoxide level, the pulse ox would still read 100%, not recognizing that 20% of that was carbon monoxide. So that's the first caveat about using pulse ox symmetry. Clearly, if a patient's pulled from a fire and has a pulse oximeter using a conventional pulse oximeter that can't tell the difference between oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin, then the saturation was low, we would say, well, there's a problem with that patient. The other question that people often ask is cyanide. If a patient was poisoned with cyanide, would the pulse oximeter have an effect from the cyanide? And the answer to that seems to be not. Pulse oximeters do not seem to be affected in their readings by cyanide levels in the bloodstream. Next question is, what's the strength of the blood flow to the digit where you place the probe? Now, we chose what we believe to be the best blood flow by using the ring finger on this patient. If for some reason we weren't getting a good signal, if he had low perfusion, we may need to place the probe on another digit on his hand or perhaps on a toe. There are probes that are specially made to put on the ear. There are probes that are made to go on the nose. And there are probes that are made to go on the forehead. You need to use a probe that's designed for whatever application you're using, in this case, a finger probe on a finger. On this particular oximeter, which is made by Massimo, as well as oximeters that are made by Datex Omeda and by Philips, we have an indicator of the actual perfusion on the patient that's called perfusion index. If you're using a brand of oximeter that has perfusion index, in an adult patient, 1.4 is a cutoff for a reliable versus an unreliable signal. In this instance, his perfusion index is well over 4. And so his perfusion to the extremity that we have the probe on is excellent. If you're doing it on a neonate, 1.27 is the threshold for good versus bad perfusion. The other question is nail polish. Can nail polish interfere with pulse ox symmetry? And in fact, three colors of nail polish actually do throw the pulse ox symmetry signal off. Black, blue, and green nail polish. So if your patient is wearing nail polish, you may use a nail polish remover, a prep pad similar to an alcohol pad that's designed to remove nail polish, has acetone on it, and the acetone would be used to wipe the nail polish off the patient's nail. You could also position the probe so that it reads sideways through the finger, avoiding the nail bed completely. Reading sideways would eliminate the effect of black, blue, or green nail polish that the patient had. Another question is, what about ambient light? And there are certain forms of ambient light that could interfere with the pulse ox signal. Sunlight is one, and very bright sunlight may require you to put a towel over the extremity that you have the pulse ox probe on. Lights that's indoors, such as fluorescent light, which you may have in the back of your ambulance or your rescue, or xenon light that may be in a sports stadium or in a place where that sort of lighting is used could interfere with the pulse ox signal. And again, putting a towel over the extremity will eliminate that interference from the readings that are being taken. 
Some people question whether sickle cell crisis or sickle cell anemia affects pulse ox readings. The answer to that is no. Sickle cell does not affect a pulse ox reading. The other question is, what about darkly pigmented skinned patients? So people who are, for example, African American or Indian who have a darker pigmentation to their skin. Pulse ox is not affected by darkly pigmented patients. And finally, hyperbilirubinemia, patients who for some reason have an elevated level of bilirubin in their bloodstream. Perhaps they're in liver failure or perhaps they have some other condition that's causing excessive levels of bilirubin. Those patients typically have a yellow appearance to their skin. That does not interfere with pulse ox. So we talked in another fire engineering video series about using pulse oximetry to take blood pressure. And again, if you were trying to assess a blood pressure, you could place the probe on the extremity, pump your blood pressure cuff up on the same extremity, and watch for the pulsation as you let the air out of the blood pressure cuff and get a rough idea of a systolic blood pressure. So those are some tips for using pulse oximetry, a common tool, something that's been added into our curriculum in the new first responder and EMT curriculum, and a very helpful device to determine what the oxygenation status of your patient is. And as oxygen becomes more important and we start to realize some of the detriments of giving oxygen to patients who have traumatic conditions such as trauma, acute myocardial infarction, or stroke, where excessive levels of oxygen may actually hurt the injury to those patients and make their conditions worse, pulse oximetry is a valuable tool for assessing patients in the EMS field. Thanks for watching Training Minutes. I'm Mike McAvoy, the EMS editor for Fire Engineering.